Cool. Well, I'm going to transition from Chris's talk about using how he set up the wharf and how he used it to how I use it for my research. So I'm a graduate student at Montana State University. Um, my background is in meteorology. I'm also a University of Utah grad, 2008 in meteorology. And uh, after that, I was in the Air Force for about six years as a, a weather guesser. Um, so I have a lot of forecasting experience, but I kind of want to talk about how we're using numerical weather model data to actually forecast snowpack structure and apply that to avalanche prediction. So I'll get into that. All right, so I'll kind of go over the objectives of my research, um, the background of this snowpack modeling system, how we went about um, actually setting this up and doing the research, go over some results and some case studies that were pretty interesting that we saw this year and even last year too. Now I'll kind of give a brief overview on what this could mean in the future for the industry. So objectives, um, really when I came into this, I wanted to see how we could improve avalanche forecasting uh, in data sparse areas, they don't, you don't have a lot of weather stations or observations coming from them. So here's an example. This is uh, the Avalanche Center's forecast region here, highlighted in black. And these blue dots are all the weather stations that they have available to them. So you can see not a whole lot of coverage, pretty sparse. So there's a lot of guessing going on, educated guessing, but still a lot of uncertainty. Um, so using modeling systems can help turn a guess into a, a more educated guess, at least give us a better picture of what's going on. So my motivation for this, when I was in the Air Force, a lot of places that we forecasted for, especially when we were deployed, were super remote, had very little data, and um, we had to rely upon model data a lot. For, so for example, two years ago, I was in Kyrgyzstan, and there's like six observations in an area about the size of uh, Montana. So we had, and there's actually nothing upstream of us. So we had very little to go off of, and we relied upon uh, model data quite a bit, at least give us a guess um, and what was gonna happen. So kind of going now into the snow world, I wanted to see, hey, how can we apply that same methodology to avalanche forecasting when we don't have a whole lot of data. So I will uh, so talk about snowpack model. So what it is, it was, it's a one-dimensional model developed by the Swiss at the Swiss Institute for um, Snow and Avalanche Research, the SLF. It's based in Davos, Switzerland. Some really, really smart guys came up with this. Um, so I said it's a one-dimensional snow cover model. To run it, you need required inputs, which includes air temperature, relative humidity, uh, wind speed, and, and or direction, and you need radiation as well to drive um, snowpack processes that happen. And it also needs either liquid precip, so SWE, or snow depth that can run the model. So here's kind of the illustration of all the different processes that go into um, driving a, a snowpack simulation. So you have solar radiation, wind, wind drifting, erosion. You have incoming radiation, outgoing radiation. It actually takes into account latent heat from precipitation, rain, or snow. Long wave radiation um, can uh, predict surface floor, it can predict meltwater runoff. Even You can even add a canopy layer that will tell um, how much of the area is covered by canopy, which impacts your long wave radiation. So Snowpack takes all of that into account to give you a simulation. So here is an example of um, outputs. It's kind of in a, a graphical uh, interface here. So this is snow grain type. This is actually from Bridger Bowl this season using the Wolf model. So what we see here is they have color-coded grain type. So new snow or decomposing new snow is this bright green or dark green. You have uh, kind of the salmon color is rounded grains. Light blue is facets. Dark blue is depth ore. And this red is melt forms, which is uh, also included as a melt freeze crust. And then you have some other layers here that aren't really used that much. So it's a pretty cool tool. It gives you a kind of a seasonal look at the structure of the snowpack and how it evolves with the season. And you can actually drag your cursor across. And on the right side here, it gives you a kind of a point look at the point in time where the snow structure profile is. So it gives you the grain types here color coded. And it even gives you the simulated hand hardness. So if you want to look at a particular point in time, you can actually put your mouse over here, and it'll give you the individual layer, what the grain type is. 
uh, the size of it and the depth. So yeah, it's a pretty neat tool. It's kind of like, Chris, you're talking about Buffkit. This is kind of like Buffkit for Snowpack in a sense. It gives you a good vis uh, visualization of what's going on. So some other tools you can look at. This is uh, puts it into more of a typical profile view. So you can put your mouse and it'll show you different layers. It'll show you grand type. Grand size and actually gives you yellow flags here based on the layering. So it gives you, you know, all these conditions and it tells you if it's a, considered a yellow flag. So it's pretty intuitive, um, pretty interesting to look at. It gives you all the way down to the bottom, right here, across the bottom, depth over facets. Is each layer a storm? Is each little rectangle on there? Not necessarily, no. It's just the way the model calculates if a layer is being formed based on whatever's going on. So you can also look at temperature. So this is temperature profile throughout the whole season of the snowpack. So blue is cold, obviously red is warm. And you can see, actually gives you a little temperature profile too on the side based on where your cursor is. So it shows you that kind of fluctuation temperature. So we obviously had some Cold temperatures here near the surface, probably has some near surface fastening going on. Another tool you can look at if it loads. This is grain size. So it gives you grain size, so these darker colors are larger grains, which indicates kind of their depth or near the bottom. And also gives you a graph of the grain size on the profile side here. And one other thing is the liquid water content. So this is from this year, a little rain, early season. And then we started getting into the warm period in March. So it's showing free liquid water beginning to melt through the snowpack. And actually, this is the big warm period we had this weekend. So it's showing liquid water that came all the way down to nearly halfway down into the snowpack. So that's kind of one of the tools that they, the Swiss has come up with to help you visualize the snowpack data. All right, so I'll talk about how I read the research. Um, so it was performed over two seasons. So 2014, 15, and this year, 15 to 16. Uh, so, so for last year, uh, we ran in snowpack using the two kilometer wharf model just for Bridger Bowl. This is kind of our introductory, trying to figure out how to use it. Um, and we also, I also set up a weather station to drive the snowpack model with observed data, not just forecasted data. I wanted to see how well both simulations ran. So valid for the, uh, the Alpine study plot, just above Al uh, Bridger Bowl, uh, Alpine, Alpine left at Bridger Bowl. And we kind of did a full snowpack validation study, just looking at each layer um, compared to field data. And then this year, we ran snowpack with uh, only forecast weather data, didn't have any weather stations to run off of, and we used the three climber wharf. So we produced uh, simulations all across western Montana, southwest Montana. And our goal was just to look at more of a case study analysis, see how well Snowpack did with major events this year. So this is where I had my study set up last year, Alpine study plot, just on top of the Alpine lift. And this is a view looking down at it. So this is Bridger Bowl, the weather station right there, and this is the weather station we set up last year. So just co-located. Wanted to get some extra data with our information. So for the observe other data that we set up, we used, um, we had air temperature, RH, we had four component radiation balance, so incoming and outgoing radiation. We had a snow up sensor and a ground temperature probe. probe. And then we used um, some data from the Bridger Bowl right next door. We used their winds and their hourly liquid precip from their heated um, rain gauge they had. So here's a look at my weather station. So here's the, the pyrometer. Oops. And here's the snow depth sensor, temperature. So to compare the simulation to, we had to get some field data. So I dug uh, a weekly profile pit every week, 19 total, and actually took 21 sweet measurements using a federal snow sampler just to compare what Snowpack was putting out. So every 10 centimeters, I gathered all that data and uh, so I could compare it, get a full validation study going. So this is kind of how it works. We have two inputs, we have forecasted weather data. We can observe other data from our weather station. Put them through the snowpack model, and we got two 
simulations here. So this is using observed weather data. This is using warp <coughs> forecasted data. So once you get that data, we're comparing to MI to our manual snow profiles. See how well they, they, they're predicting the snowpack. So we used kind of all these parameters to look at and compare. And then we had two different analyses. And my goal was to compare how accurate well, how much accuracy do we lose by using forecast of weather data to draft the model instead of using observed weather data? That's really what I was interested in. So to do that, obviously, a weather model needs to be accurate to drive uh, a good snowpack model. So last year, the WARF did good at te air temperature, relative humidity, reflected shortwave, and snow surface length. I say good, I say better than the other parameters. Not perfect, but decent. And, but the wharf is, we were talking about over, over forecast precipitations and winds. The reason why the winds is because our study site was in a sheltered location. And wharf typically has higher wind speeds that were more valid for the ridge top than down in a sheltered location. So you, it gets artificially um, over predicted. If we were to compare that to the ridge winds, it'd be a lot better. Incoming was also, incoming shortwave was also <coughs> forecasted, but our study plot was pretty shaded. So WARF doesn't take any shading into account, it's just a direct solar radiation. So here's an example, this is a forecast to temperature versus observed temperature. So we want to see um, the, the plots are along this one-to-one -one line, means that they're perfectly correlated. So you can see it does, it did a really good job last year. Um, slightly under, I say over forecast temperature when it got really cold, but still pretty good. Here's some statistics. So the R squared value, the correlation where one is perfect, is actually a 0.9, so pretty good. Pretty even on the bias, and the absolute error was less than two degrees C. So on average, each observation was within, or each forecasted observation was within two degrees of what we had, what we saw. So it's pretty good. We'll take a look at what it didn't do well. This is accumulated precipitation last year, so this is from the Alpine Weather Station, they had, and this is also wind corrected. Uh, so they had 31 and a half inches of precip from November to end of May last year. And this is from the Snowtail Station at Rat Creek. Had a little bit more over there. Probably catches a little more of the precip than the heating rain bucket. And this is what Wharf predicted over that same time period. So 53 inches. So quite a big difference compared to um, the weather station. At eight, over 18 inches of over predicted, so 65% over predicted. So this year, the wharf did a lot better. Um, they had a much more realistic precip amounts at Bridger Bowl. So this is a comparison. So this is at the end of March. Wharf predicted 24 inches, and Rack Creek at 21, almost 22, and Bridger Bowl had almost 19. So if we combine this compared it to Rack Creek. 10% over prediction, much better than the 69% we saw last year. So the reason for that, this is where the grid point was last year. Notice it's on the um, upwind side, or the windward side of the mountain range. And this year, it was on the lee side. So we're thinking, um, we think there's a lot more precip that was forecasting at the top of this range than we actually got, especially on the other side where we were verifying it. So I think that's a big reason why we had such a better accuracy this year than last year, it was just the grid point location. So we ran the data through Snowpack, and first thing we looked at was snow depth. So this is last year's snow depth. Um, here's from my weather station, just next door, uh, at Alpine, Racket Creek, and this is what Wharf Snowpack predicted. So it did easily. <coughs> And then just over forecasted snow depth, had less settling, more precipitation, and actually melted out a little bit quicker. So accuracy was about 50% throughout the season on average. This year, this is Wharf in the red, following Bracket Creek a lot better. Here's our stats. So accuracy, if you look at Alpine, 76% accurate, Bracket Creek, 87% accuracy. So it's a lot better than last year. Um, so it's, Snow height's kind of finicky because it's a lot, there's a lot of variability in snow height um, across the mountain range, so. But generally, you can see the model did pretty good this year. So let's look at a few case studies using the grain type. So observed weather data with the simulation and forecasted. So
So last year, about a week later, was formed in early December, and we had a good analytic cycle during the Thanksgiving time frame. And this is from the forecast center, two millimeter facets with a lot of snow on top. That's pretty much what we saw. Same thing here, storm slab, weak layer. So they did a good job showing that. We had a big warm up, as you guys know, last year in January and February, created a lot of melt freeze crust later on in the month. So these red stripes indicate those melt freeze crust that formed. And here's my pit from that same time period. So I saw four in the top part of the snowpack. And here's a picture of that snowpack, so you can see the crust and those stripes right there. So I did a decent job showing that as well, showed those formations of those crusts. And then lastly, the spring melt, isothermal transition in mid-March, it went warm pretty fast. So here's the red indicates melt forms or melt water that percolates in the snowpack. Or if had it really fast, I think that's due to the over forecasting winds. But that's pretty much what I saw. This is a profile from my plot in like March. You notice all the melt forms, pretty much almost down to the bottom. Isothermal <laughs> snowpack, and you can see I mean, it's very, it was really moist um, all the way down. You can see some melt water percolate or accumulating on top of these crusts here too. All right, so for the actual pit data, I want to just calculate the accuracy compared to my 19 field days. How did, how well did the simulations do? So compare the two simulations using different inputs. So density was all right. Some back using observed data was a little better. Same with temperature, did a little better in density though. Grain size, actually the wharf had a little better um, accuracy with that. Grain type, pretty similar. And even had hard, hand hardness, a little better accuracy. Um, so what we see is, if we compare the accuracies between the two simulations, they're pretty even if you just combine them all. So what we've seen is, besides snow depth itself, if you go below that and just look at the microstructure, what's going on in the snowpack, the accuracy is still pretty even considering what kind of inputs we're using, which was encouraging to see if we want to use this more operationally. So we'll look at um, what we did this year. So as I said, we produced simulations for six locations across western Montana. And uh, we just compared the simulations to various field data from Bridger Bowl, from Eric at the Flathead Center, um, and, some, and also from the Ed Lunch Center here. So here are the uh, Bruce one for Bridger Bowl at 1,700 feet, then Saddle Peak, Willow Pass, Stewart Mountain, uh, Noisy Basin, and top of Big Mountain. So we'll look at Big Mountain first, look at snow depth comparison. So this is what they observed, and this is the model. So generally following the trend, but a little over or under predicted in terms of snow depth. And this is the actual simulation of grain type. So there's this big, what you were talking about, Chris, earlier, the atmospheric river event in December. So this is observed fit from the southern, I believe this is the Flathead Range. So here's new snow on top of that big, thick rain crust that we saw in December. Here's the point in time profile. So here's that new snow. Here's that big uh, melt freeze crust. Didn't show it freezing all the way down but still um, showed the general location of it and then all of the weak facet snow at the bottom. So they did a good job showing that structure. Uh, later in the year, so this is from March 19th, outside of the Whitefish Mountain Resort. This is point in time where the profile was taken. So they had a lot of crust in there. We even the surface buried surface water layer. So let's kind of compare. There's that 313 crust, the 36 crust, and even the surface water layer was shown. It was definitely, um, Eric, you were saying it was pretty decomposed, but it still showed up in the simulation, which is uh, pretty impressive. Did it show the jack rubber layer? Or no? it, it, all it shows is kind of new snow or decomposing the, snow. The it can't. Layer is pretty deep. Yeah, oh, well, it's right here. You can't really, it won't, snowpack won't discriminate if it's dropple, if it's uh, snow, what kind of snow type it is, unfortunately. And the Valentine's Day crest, which is formed right here. So generally showing those crust, even surface oil, which is pretty encouraging to see. Next, I want to take a look at this noisy basin. So this is snow depth comparison. Um, so kind of a way under prediction of snow depth there in the early part of the season, and as well as here. Beginning to catch up a little bit, but still under predicted. This is direct model output using wharf in the snowpack. This is for 6,000 feet, so it predicted 
pretty much instantaneous meltwater percolation from that December event um, all the way down to the ground. A lot of the observations, though, that I wanted to compare to were a little higher up, so I just did a typical lapse rate adjustment to kind of adjust the snowpack file up to 7,000 feet, and this is the simulation that we got. So a little bit colder, which means we don't have as much rain. So here's that December crust. And then I'll take a look at a case study that we uh, had a big avalanche event during this time. So we had a cold period in late December, and there were some observations of actually surface ore forming up there in the Swan Range. But snowpack, for some reason, simulated it as depth toward the surface. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but we can interpret that as it's a weak layer. So weak layer was formed here. And they also, this is a big issue, they had freezing rain, thin freezing rain crust that drew on the 12th. The snowpack, unfortunately, doesn't predict or use freezing rain. There's a one threshold discriminator between rain and snow. So freezing rain will form when the temperature is below freezing, but snowpack can't tell if it's freezing rain or snow. So it just called it snow, and that's what it had here. So there was a crust that formed right here below that surface floor and below this new storm snow that came in. Um, so five and almost 5.2 uh, inches of sweet was observed in the noisy basin snow tail in 48 hours and this big storm came in. And as you can imagine, a lot of snow, a lot of weight on top of the weak layer. They had to issue an avalanche warning, they had a lot of avalanches going. So this is one um, noisy basin, three and a half foot crown that fell, failed above that freezing rain crust, or below the freezing rain crust. So pretty big event. And we'll take a look at how snowpack simulated that. So this is a point in time profile. There's a new snow, kind of underpredicted as uh, we were saying earlier, but still a lot of load regardless on top of this weak layer interface. So it's filled the structure pretty well. Uh, okay, look at Stewart Mountain, as we said. Um, way over predicted the preset, which Matt Arshno that was over predicted, predicted as well. And here's just a quick look at the profile. So pretty widespread rain event in December and it showed up in this um, simulation as well. And Lungo Pass didn't have anything to compare to, but I just wanted to show it. It really showed quite a bit of um, not water percolation early in the season. It makes sense, it's a lower elevation, so it's definitely a wetter, a warmer snowpack. Uh, so the last thing to look at is Saddle Peak. So for Saddle Peak, we didn't have, we didn't actually put, have a direct model output for that specific location, but I used a combination of uh, weather station from Slushman's and the ridge. And whatever data was missing from that, we need to draw the simulation, I gathered that from more. So we kind of had a, a mix of inputs. But, so here's the simulation, and I'll take a look at a uh, little advent cycle we had in late December. So we had kind of our cold spell in um, November with all that weak, that weak layers that formed there. And then pattern change, we got a lot of snow and ridgers in December. So this is kind of what we'll look at. This is um, late December. So from the Avalon Center, Argentina Bowl, South Peak, football field, they're all releasing during that week. A lot of snow on weak facets in the ground. So here's the crown line from Avalanche football field, field on facets in the ground. And this is one from South Peak, wind slab on top of facets. So how did Snowpack handle this um, case study? Here's our new snow from December. And here's the facets on the ground that it simulated. So again, showing that storm sled weak layer structure pretty well. And then um, football field went again on February 14th. This is a remotely skier triggered one. I'm sure you've all seen the video that Diana Sally put out. Um, so she actually had a time lapse camera set up on the gun map um, looking over Slushman's and caught this avalanche event. Skiers were over here and triggered it. So and this is kind of what it looked like a screenshot. Went over the cliffs here. Good little powder blast. Here's the crown line, courtesy of the Avalanche Center. So we'll take a look at how Snowpack showed that. New snow, they, a little bit more than what you guys saw. I think I saw you, you said there's only four or five inches on the ground, or on new snow that forms over that, that weak layer that caused the avalanche. Interesting though, you see this pink stripe Snowpack predicted a little bit of surface ore. I don't know if you guys actually saw any surface ore. Do you remember? Alex? No. Um, it's, so, yeah, it's it's so profile, false alarm. Like it failed closer to the ground. Closer to the ground. 
So that floor is where it fails. And that's what's shown right here in this blue striped area. So kind of concluding, some packs shown this structure pretty well in these, during these events. It's not perfect, but it's doing good. So to conclude, um, you have to really know that your model biases. So as we said, depending on where your grid point is, is it overpredicting precipitation? Are you looking to do a simulation in a more sheltered area? So that means your winds are going to be higher. You have to adjust for that. Um, so the warp, as I said, coupling these models together produces a pretty good simulation of the snowpack. It's fairly realistic, not perfect. You see maybe some layers that aren't present or layers that were present that wasn't simulated, but generally that's pretty good. Ideally though, you still want to use observe other data. That's going to be your best because it's what you observe and the, what was actually, um, you actually saw at the site you're trying to simulate. Um, so not, not always accurate using these models, but I think what's more important for avalanche forecasting is not the total snow on the ground, it's actually the what's going on beneath the, the total snow height, what's the structure doing. And it did pretty well showing that. So, and as I said, I showed some case studies with during avalanche events and the structure was shown pretty well as well. So, as I said, coupled model, coupling these models together can help fill in data void areas, gaps in, in uh, your forecast area. Not perfect, but it's better than nothing. So as I said, it turns your guess into a more of an educated guess. Um, combining using observable other data, but filling the gaps in with model data is definitely a possibility. And it's probably what um, we'll see this being used more as. Um, in the future, we're going to get better weather models. Every year they're coming out with upgrades, faster, higher resolution. And that's really going to help drive snowpack models and create more accurate simulations. And the Swiss are updating snowpack all the time as well to make it more sophisticated and accurate. So I think in the future we're going to see this being used more and more. So does this mean um, you guys don't have to go out and fill any more dig pits? That um, you can just rely on the model to know what the snowpack structure is? Absolutely not. You should never rely on that. I don't think it's ever going to come to that. It's kind of like weather models. We're never going to look at a weather model over an observation if we had it because it's just more accurate. But it does provide us um, kind of a look into what is going on if we don't have a good idea. Um, but I think we're going to start seeing these being used a lot more in the future. The Swiss are using them quite a bit now since they're the ones that developed it, obviously. Um, the Canadians are using it. Um, not so much in America yet, but uh, John Snook from the CIC, he's used Snowpack and Wharf quite a bit, and uh, he's come up with some, some interesting um, forecasts. Um, so he's using it, but kind of still getting traction in the U.S. But I think, especially at this year's ISSW, you're going to see a lot more of this research being presented. So um, that is all I have. I just want to thank, um, obviously, Yordi, my advisor, Dan Miller and uh, Carl Berkland on my committee for guiding me and Bridger Bowl for helping me out set up study plots and use their weather data. And obviously Chris National Weather Service, huge help getting the war from model going for me. So I, um, that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Can you yeah. correct can you correct snowpack mid season? Like once you do your bit and you decide There is the Yeah, there is an option um, to initialize a snowpack. I asked the Swiss kind of how it works, and they're like, don't do it. Don't use it. So, like you example, even on Saddle Peak, like yeah. that was a repeat. Yeah. You know, so if you could, the model was able to show that all oh, over now down to 60 centimeters. Yeah, they do give you a way to do that, but it's it's really complex. You have to have measurements of how much free liquid water is in the snowpack and really specific uh -huh. stuff like that, and it's just not right. usable. So that's something I think the Swiss hopefully will be working on to make it easier, so you can initialize your model throughout the season. Yeah. Sure. Um, in, in terms of precipitation, both from the warp and snowpack, did you find that if all, there were any uh, sort of thresholds where maybe either model handle <coughs> do increase it better for like larger storms or smaller storms, or or no? Uh, I would say larger storms. Um, for in general. For the warp. Or for, the, for the warp, yeah. Um, well, yeah, putting the warp in the snowpack, yeah. It, 
I think it handled a lot better with uh, larger scale storms. It's just tough to really resolve those small scale things. Of course, we saw like um, this past storm at Bridger, it actually almost completely nailed the forecast, which you don't see, we didn't see a whole lot this season where it was right on. It would generally show, all right, this is when we have accumulating snow, this is when we have melt events, this is when we have cold events, the good on temperature, so it would show that those weak layers forming um, in November and, um, and early January, but it's still really difficult to nail in on those mountain events because it's just so complex. Um, it's, I think it's still going to be a while before we can actually have really good confidence in a point forecast for a specific point in complex terrain. So, that's all I have. Anything else? Good question. Yeah. Where you're talking about um, the over prediction on several of those different parameters, um, were they consistent enough that you could recalibrate? And oh, yeah. tighten that gap mm -hmm. there a little bit? Yeah, that's actually one thing we did for this year's um, Bridger Bowl simulation. It, we just we put a bias correction onto the wind. So for example, I think I dropped it down to like, you do a multiplier. So if it's 0.8, you drop it by 20%. If it's 0.1, you drop it by 90%. Actually, I think my multiplier for the winds were 0.19. So because it's in such a sheltered location, the winds are that much lower there than on the ridge top, and that's kind of what the forecast of the winds are doing, how strong they are in the model. So you really have to bias correct your winds and kind of know, all right, I want to have a simulation for this area. Here's my point forecast. Are the winds realistic there? If not, all right, I'm dropping my winds down. I mean, you can kind of play with it and see, okay, this looks more accurate. We'll stick with this bias correction. So you do the same thing for temperature like I did with noisy basin. I bias correct the temperature just to simulate a higher elevation spot, and it showed it pretty well. So, yeah, the bias correction is pretty important uh, when you're using these forecasts. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.